Now, quickly before we start, I just have to say thank you all so much for your support throughout the years. We're nearly at 1 million subscribers and we can almost taste it. Right, without further ado, let's get on to the video. It is an early May afternoon and there is panic in a silver mine. Smoke has filled up some of the working areas and miners are trying to escape to the surface. The shift had 173 men operating in the mine and there were only limited routes to the surface. Frantically, men are being hoisted out, but the toxic fumes are suffocating many. By 2pm, emergency responders are starting to arrive, but miners, including the host operator, would be dead. The disaster would take the name of the rather cheery-sounding sunshine. It would go down as one of the worst mine disasters of the 20th century in the United States and the worst in Idaho's history. A new nightmare, at least for me, has now been unlocked, lost in the bellowing toxic smoke from a fire and suffocating to death trapped hundreds of feet underground. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Background. Our story begins with this stuff, silver. I don't need to tell you the obvious, but I will, that it's valuable. And just to illustrate this, I spent £15 on this silver ingot like a mug. The story of the Sunshine Mine goes all the way back to the 1880s, with a claim of ore deposits being filed in Shoshun County, Idaho. And I'm sure I completely balls up that pronunciation. Operations on the site stayed fairly small until a number of acquisitions resulted in the formation of the Sunshine Mining Company. The exact year is not really known due to it being formed from multiple existing operations. A note on the Archives West website even says this, which has copies of the company's accounts history. It says... It's unclear exactly when the Sunshine Mining Company was founded, since it grew out of already existing companies. They seem to estimate it was between 1908 and 1918. Regardless, the company was set on trying to exploit the mine, which was 8 miles east of Kellogg, Idaho. And just as a side note here, why whenever the name Kellogg is involved, the story always ends up in tragedy. In 1922, the company built a 25 ton per day mill. Over the years, as the mine was better exploited and production increased, the mill would be modified and upgraded to processing over 500 tons per day. But the mine did not only produce shiny, shiny silver, but also lead, copper, and zinc, with work focusing around the Sunshine and Chester veins. Over the years, the mine would grow adding additional levels and shafts. By the early 1970s, the mine bottomed out at 6,000 feet, with a level at roughly intervals of 200 feet. The company had a staff complement of around 522 people, of which 429 were underground workers, and this was split over three shifts over five days a week. The main entrance to the mine was through a thing called the jewel shaft, which began along a 200 foot long horizontal section. Mining on site was done via a horizontal cut and sand fill method. Ventilation was created via underground fans, which sucked air down the jewel shaft, then pushed it into the mine and after travelling around the number 12 borehole and back up via multiple joints between the levels, it was then exhausted out of the big hole shaft. In addition to this, aircon was also installed at the lower levels to keep the working temperature a bit more habitable. As I mentioned before, the main entry and exit to the mine was via the dual shaft. This had a chippy hoist for transporting materials and staff from the surface down to the 3700 foot level, with another hoist in shaft number 10 to reach the lower levels. This was a bit of a bottleneck, as men had to wait their turn to be hauled to the surface. This wasn't an issue during normal working, as start and end times of shifts can be planned around a passage of personnel. But in an emergency, it could be a big issue. Understandably, smoking was prohibited in certain areas of the mine, especially around electrical equipment and the obvious not smoking around explosive stores. 
to help with firefighting, most of the mine's work sites had one or two inch water pipes which could be tapped into for dousing any fires. Scattered around were also fire extinguishers and to protect workers, in the case of a fire in the dual shaft, fire doors were installed on levels 3100 and 3700. At various points around the mine, there were also fire plans and procedures printed for supervisors and staff to follow. Communications lines ran from the surface to the hoist rooms, first aid area, workshops and shafts, but vitally not to every work area. Instead, to pass a message to a person, then someone would have to physically go there and speak to them. This is kind of all very good in theory, but what about in practice? The disaster. It is the morning of the 2nd of May 1972 and 173 workers are beginning their shift at the Sunshine Mine. The morning shift is between 7am and 3pm and it seems like a normal day as miners reach their scheduled workstations. Today the upper management aren't on site, they are attending a board meeting some 45 miles away. As such, local foremen are in charge of daily operations but they are only tasked with managing their own respective teams, leaving no overall management in place for the whole operation. Lunchtime for the workers is around 11 to 11.30 in the morning. Most eat around their work areas. Again, so far, everything seemed like a normal day. At around 11.40 in the morning, smoke was discovered coming from the 9.10 rays down on level 3700. An alert was sent out. Smoke was rapidly filling up the mine. The foreman on the number 10 shaft ordered an evacuation and this was around 12 p.m. Rapidly men started being hauled from the lower levels up to the 3100 level but that didn't mean that they were safe. In order to reach the surface they had to make their way down the long 3100 level to reach the bottleneck of the dual shaft. The first many workers knew of the fire was when smoke entered their work areas as the evacuation order was slow to reach each part of the mine. This was because of for most areas someone had to physically go to the workstations to verbally inform them of the emergency. Not the most effective way I must say. The hoist on the 10 shaft for the best part of the next hour went up and down picking up workers and taking them to the 3100 foot level. However, at 1 minute past 1 in the afternoon, the number 10 shaft hoistman was overcome by smoke. Many workers were still trapped on the low levels. The bottleneck on the 3100 level would begin to take its victims. Multiple men had passed out from the carbon monoxide fumes. A makeshift rescue team descended down the dual shaft to help any men trying to reach safety. Interestingly, many men's self-rescue packs had failed, leaving them helpless to the fumes. The last surviving miner from the 3100 level would reach the surface at half one in the afternoon. Rescue and recovery operations would end up involving over 100 personnel from multiple mines in the region. By around 4.30 in the afternoon, the first bodies were recovered from the 3700 level. Even at this stage, the location of the fire wasn't exactly known, leaving rescue crews fumbling around in the darkness of the smoke, but they knew the rough area was around the 910 rays. Multiple attempts to reach the number 10 shaft failed when responders met heat and thick smoke. Over the following days, bulkheads would be built inside the mine in order to redirect in fresh air and exhaust smoke. Workers would approach the number 10 shaft from two directions. The first was from the dual shaft and the other was from the Silver Summit mine which connected to the Sunshine mine. On the 7th of May at around 8pm, both rescue crews reached each other on the 3100 foot level. During this time, multiple bodies had been found and recovered. Parts of the 910 rays was discovered to have caved in. Amazingly, two men had actually survived in a lower section of the mine in an area not overcome with smoke, and they had endured over 175 hours in the darkness. So by the 13th of May, all of the dead had been recovered. The number had totaled 91 and they were spread over eight levels. All during this time, the fire was still smouldering away. The area that the fire was thought to be in was backfilled with sand and sealed off, starving it of fuel and air. During the tail end of the recovery operation, the investigation into the fire began, which neatly leads us onto the next part of this video. The investigation. 
The Federal Bureau of Mines set up an investigation committee almost immediately after the last body was recovered. Access to the area that had caught fire was severely restricted, mainly due to several cave-ins as this was because of the fire burning away the vital roof supports. The site was pulled over and all surviving staff were interviewed. Multiple violations of material storage, communications and safety rules were found. Although the exact cause was very difficult to find due to all of the evidence being burnt away and buried. It was discovered around the time of the disaster that ventilation leaks had been filled in. A side effect of this was that some waste areas where timber, used oil and paper were being stored were no longer being cooled and ventilated by the leaking air. Potentially, this allowed the waste to become very hot due to oxidisation of some of the material, which after enough time and heat could lead to spontaneous combustion. The location of the fire near the air intake side of the mine allowed the deadly smoke to circulate the mine as quickly as it did. The Federal Bureau of Mines released their report in July of 1972 and listed nine main contributing factors to the severe loss of life. The emergency skateway system from the mine was not adequate for a rapid evacuation. Top mine officials were not at the mine on the day of the fire and no person had been designated as being in charge of the entire operation. Individual supervisors were reluctant to order immediate evacuation or make a major decision such as stopping the 3400 level fans. Company personnel delayed ordering evacuation of the mine for about 20 minutes while they searched for the fire. The series of ventilation system used in the mine caused all persons in by the fire, which contaminated the main intake airways to be exposed to smoke and carbon monoxide. Most of the underground employees had not been trained in the use of the provided self-rescuers and had difficulty in using them. Some self-rescuers provided by the company had not been maintained in a usable condition. Mine survival training, including evacuation procedures, barricading and hazards of gases such as carbon monoxide had not been given to mine employees. The emergency fire plan developed by the company was not effective. The company had not conducted evacuation drills. Abandoned areas of the mine had not been sealed to exclude contaminated air from entering the ventilation airstreams. Controls built into the ventilation system did not allow the isolation of number 10 shaft and its hoist rooms and service raises or the compartmentalization of the mine. Smoking gases from this fire was thus able to move unrestricted into almost all workings and travelways. Pretty much as soon as the fire had started, the men down the mine were doomed. Sweeping reforms would come in 1977 with the Federal Mine Safety and Health Act requiring multiple annual inspections of underground mines. But don't get me wrong, mining is still very dangerous, but it was a step in the right direction. The mine would be shut down for seven months for repairs and refurbishing. Upon reopening, the mine's production would increase, producing nearly 20% of the country's silver ore. The site would officially cease operations in 2001, although there have been attempts to restart it over the years. So scale time, I reckon it's going to be a four, but the thought of being trapped underground with a raging fire is in my mind much higher. And this is what I've got for the bingo card. Do you agree? Let me know below. This is a plaintiff production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. Plaintiff videos are produced by me, John, in a currently very warm corner of Southern London, UK. I have a second YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter or X, whatever the hell you want to call it. And I'd also like to say a very nice and warm thank you to my Patreon YouTube members for your financial support, as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching and Mr. Music, play us out, please. Thank you.